This is the Spa Retailer Podcast, where we talk retail, business, and all things related to the hot tub industry. I'm your host, Megan Kendrick, owner of Spa Retailer Magazine. Welcome to the Spa Retailer Podcast. Today, I am delighted to have on the podcast Martin Holland, the owner of Anil Coaching. He's a business coach. He's my business coach. And we've got him writing a column in the magazine this year. And so welcome to the podcast, Martin. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm delighted that you're delighted. (laughs) Martin and I spend quite a bit of time together every other week for an hour or so going over whatever happens to be going on in the business that week. And so I thought it would be really fun to have him on just to talk about that a little bit. But then also we have him writing this column this year. And so after every edition of the column, we are going to talk about it on the podcast. Excellent. So Martin, I know you fairly well at this point. We've been working together for over a year now. But tell our listeners, how did you end up where you're at? How did you end up being a business coach? I've been in business for 49 years now, mostly in my own. I had uh, a a broad range of industries. I ran grain elevators in Nebraska for 12 years. I've had two manufacturing companies, two contracting companies, one research and development company with GMOs out of the University of Oklahoma, a chemical company, and Of those companies, I think six before I became a coach, I helped start, and two of them failed. We sold four of them. And after I sold the last one, I was was just a little bit tired of doing that. They were all, most of them were startups. And I was just a little tired of it. And I thought, perhaps I know something and I might be able to help people. And so I thought, looked around and I heard about business coaching, which at the time was a little bit more novel than it is now. There are lots of coaches for topics. I thought, well, I'll try to do that. How hard could it be, right? (laughs) Well, it was a couple of years. I mean, I survived them, but it was a couple of years before I figured out how to do it. It's coaching, but it's still, you're still starting a brand new business. It's, and that, yeah, that brand new business thing, that's the thing about startups. And that's why I didn't want to do it again is now. Spa companies and pool companies, there's a market for what you sell. You may not be able to sell it at a profit or run your business at a profit, but there's a market. When you have a new product, you have to add that complexity to the mix. There are all the issues that go along with running a business, but you don't know if anybody will buy what you're selling. And so that that was a pretty exhausting exercise. But I've figured it out, I think, and uh, absolutely having a blast. Absolutely. Over the years, because I've spent a career um, interviewing small business owners, that's what I've done since 2008. And so specifically small business owners in the hot tub industry and a little bit in the pool industry too. And I always found that the ones that seemed to be the most successful and ran their businesses by the numbers and just had really great companies and were really great leaders they always had a coach at some point in their journey. And so when I bought the magazines, I knew that was something that I wanted to do as well. Um, eventually, I had to make a little money first before I could afford one. But <laughs> but that was, it's been really beneficial. And it's so helpful to me just to have somebody, a neutral party that I can bounce ideas off of and have someone say, no, Megan, you're really okay. This is really okay. This is normal. <laughs> Or watch out. Yeah. Fortunately, we haven't had too many of those conversations yet. I also have had three. I don't have a coach at this time, but I've had three coaches. I was going to ask you if you had, if you had a coach. Yeah. Yeah. And really a benefit too, because they get me off my own self-imposed pity parties when I'm feeling sorry for myself or whatever it is. That is so Basically lacking to do what I know I need to do. So. Yes. There have been a, there was one time last year where you're like, okay, I'm just going to call you. We're just going to touch base every day and make sure that you're right. doing what the thing that you, the things that you do not want to do, but need to do. You don't have that accountability a lot of times as a business owner. You're it. Who's going to tell you to get stuff done? Your employees, like for the most part, business owners are really self-motivated, but everybody gets in a rut sometimes. Absolutely. So we are in 
Norman, Oklahoma, but you mentioned that you spent some time in Nebraska. How did you land in Norman? I was born here and went to high school, and I went to Nebraska. Absolutely, this is the truth, because I didn't want to stay in Oklahoma. I wanted to branch out and go somewhere. Looked at Colorado to ski, but in 1969, Boulder, Colorado, there was a place called The Hill, and as you drove by, you'd get high, right? <laughs> I think that's still, I think that's still the case in Boulder today. Yeah, it's, it's more <laughs> accepted, but it wasn't for me. So my second love was pheasant hunting and people make fun of it, but it's the truth. I went to Nebraska so I could go pheasant hunting and I did. I think people uh, have chosen, long. I think people have chosen colleges for stranger reasons. It was, I did well in college, but guy from Pennsylvania and I hunted every day of season for the three years that we crossed over and, and literally every single day. After class, before class, all day on the week. Anyway, that's too much information, but that's why I went to Nebraska. And I was sitting on the plains of Nebraska at the right page of what, 30 maybe? And the grain business is fascinating because it's commodities and it's a whole lot of sure. lot of things going on. And as as I began to learn it, it got to be repetitive and stressful. And I thought, do I want to be sitting up here when I reach that old age of 40? and be doing the same thing. And I said, no, I don't. So I came back to Oklahoma and then things followed. So the column that you wrote in our last, our last issue, it was the start of everything, where you start with everything in a business, which is your financial statements. We have done articles in the past about financial statements and how to use them to run your business. And they've been some of the most popular that we've ever had. And I still occasionally get people who call me up and are like, hey, do you remember that? Do you remember that article you did that one time where you compared people's service numbers? And so that is what I was hoping that we could do again. Sure. Because again, we could all use a refresher on why these are important. So today, though, I was hoping we could just talk through the basics of what all of these statements are and what they mean to your business. Okay. If I can preface that just real quickly with something, I consider there to be four primary fundamentals, I call them a business. And they're guiding the business, getting the business, doing the business and administering the business. Guiding the business is leadership. It's knowing, do we want to expand? How big do we want to get? What's the culture around here? How do, what's our plan for the year? What's our goal? How do I incentivize people? How do I hold people accountable? It's leadership. Most people in business, and I've worked with over 400 companies, are aware of all those things, but spend precious little time developing them. Getting the business is marketing and sales, which I don't need to describe further. Doing the business in this case would be selling and installing and then administering the business. The way I describe that to people who founded a business is that it's everything you never even heard of when you started your business. There's and lots among of those, like that. Oh, there are. The other thing I describe <clears throat> with new clients is that, and probably our listeners here, you will spend more time. And by that, I don't mean hours, but more mental capacity on those other three functions, guiding, getting, and administering the business than you do in the fundamental thing that you're selling. And that's because you know how to do it. The guys know how to do it. You've got systems and process imposed by manufacturers. And so it's the things outside of actual production that gets you. And the place that I find most lacking is in administration. And the first thing that's most lacking in his administration is good books. And so we're full circle back to where you would like me to go. People oftentimes don't understand the need or the value of having good books. They think in terms of I have to have them to pay taxes. And they think I have to have them because my banker wants them. But maybe not our listeners, but most businesses I deal with do not know if they made money last month. And quite frequently, they don't know if they made money last year. They don't find out until September of the following year because they get an extension on their taxes. And they finally file them in September. And then they say, what? I made all this money and why don't I have it? Right? Well, books are so much more valuable than just being useful to pay taxes or to placate your banker. And that's what we'd like to show. I think that's your purpose in the series yeah. that we're writing. The first article that appeared really is just a primer, a primer. And we'll just run through it really quickly. Yeah. This immense black hole of finance that people don't like in bookkeeping. 
I never suggest that the owner of the business do the books themselves, ever. Yeah, that I was doing the books myself. I didn't want to be doing the books, but I was until I got hooked up with you and you recommended a bookkeeper that was a lifesaver. Yeah, and they, but first of all, they can be complex. And you as a business owner, who's really good at spas or pools, are not going to know much about it. And so you're likely to not do a very good, not likely, you're certain to not do a very good job, at least not a current job. You won't keep the books current. So if they're not current, they're not as useful. And the second thing is that your time is much better spent doing what you do and letting a professional take care of your books. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that, um, this is true for a lot of things, but one of the reasons people don't hire an accountant or a bookkeeper to do their books is they self-deselect. They say, I can't afford it. And then my answer is, well, how much does it cost? Well, I don't know. But why don't we look into it and yeah. see how we can do it and yeah. set up processes and get it taken care of? That's so true. And there have been a couple of times where we've had that exact situation with the bookkeeping. It was like, I just, I can't imagine, I can't afford one. But no, I, I could. <laughs> Yeah, very reasonable. And then the same with the same with health insurance. I was like, right. I just, I don't know how we can afford this. And you're like, how much does it cost? Of course, I had no idea. I've just heard business owners complain about the cost of health insurance for years and years. And we were able to add it this year. And it wasn't right. a crippling expense. And you have one other, as I recall, HR. Oh, yeah, that as well. Yeah. yeah. Another one that I can't afford an attorney to do this. Why yes. much does it cost? Not that much, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So. Recently hired an attorney to help with our putting together our employee handbook. So we're, we're wandering a little bit from bookkeeping, but the principles are the same for all of those. But back to the fundamentals. First, I don't expect business owner to do the books. Uh, I don't expect the business owner to become really well-versed, although as they begin to use them, They'll become more and more interested and get more and more information. But back to the fundamentals there, good books produce three reports and they're the profit and loss, okay, which everybody has heard of. And I've never met anybody who didn't at least try to figure out that I bring in more than I spent. So that's the first one, the balance sheet, uh, which we'll talk about what that is in just a little bit. People have heard of that. And most people have at least prepared one. If you want a bank loan, the bank will give you an application and what you're doing is filling out a balance sheet. Yeah. And then the third one, most business owners, matter of fact, I have to say, I don't think I've ever met a business owner running a company under a hundred million dollars in sales who had ever even heard of the statement of cash flows. Our listeners might be distracted from listening to us right now because they're thinking about cash flow. <laughs> oh, this is a really good podcast. But there's man, a, I'm wondering, is there's that guy going to pay keeps, me? There's nothing that keeps a business owner up at night more than cash. Where did my cash go? The book that I wrote is called The Profit Problem. They say I make money. Why don't I have any? Which we and, will which we will link to in our show notes. Okay. And I, yeah. I definitely recommend it. I read it and it was, yeah, it was a great book. And I didn't read it just because my business coach wrote it. It was, it was actually helpful. Thank you for that. And the point I'm kind of making is, you don't have to become a bookkeeper or an accountant, but uh, just saying those three, three reports, the three commission reports, profit, loss, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, the profit, they are the reports that answer five fundamental questions that have been with us since the dark ages, literally. I have a little history in my book on that, literally since the dark ages, the merchants of Venice and so on were concerned with these questions. And the five questions that are answered by the financials are, am I making money? What do I own? What do I owe? What's left over for me? And where did my cash go? Okay. The, the financial statements answer those questions. And the thing that I like about books that really make it fun is you need to know all those things, but they're historic. Right? They're looking backwards. How much did I make? Not how much am I going to make? What do I own now? What do I owe now? What's left over for me now? And where did my cash go over the last, whatever we're talking, month, year, whatever period of time? They're all rearward looking. And you need that information. IRS needs it. You need it. It's a foundation of your ability to make decisions. But what I'm keenly interested in, what our articles will be talking about is the sixth, what I call the sixth question. What should I do? Yeah. And the books 
can tell you if you even have a chance, right? I mean, uh, they, they will show you what you have to do to bid in the article that's coming out. Maybe it's out now. I don't know the next article coming out. I lead off with this question. Did you know that if you raised your prices by 1%, you would increase your net profit by 14 and a half percent. Now, a lot of if times, if your expenses stay the same, <laughs> if you, if your overhead stays the same, oh, yeah. okay. That if you raise your prices 10%, Megan, why do people not want to raise their prices? Because they're afraid of losing customers. 100%. Or losing sales. Did you know, would you feel better about raising prices? If you knew that if you raised your prices 10%, you could lose 22% of your customers and make the same amount of profit. Yeah. And the reason I use that statistic is one exercise I work with a lot of, most of my clients, is I try to get them to raise prices. One, because I want them to make more money, but it's a mental exercise. And I hear everything. Oh, I can't raise his prices. He refers me a lot of stuff or the competition will kill me. What did the competition bid? I don't know, but they'll kill me. But yeah. if you realize you could lose 10% of your business and make the same amount of money, you have a little bit of, it gives you confidence, a little courage, stick your chin out. Next bid, you go in, raise the price. Yeah. Give them a reason other than price to buy from you. Yeah, it's interesting. Jeff Bassmeyer was on the podcast, the last one, I believe. And that was something that he talked about where they built this brand new, beautiful showroom and they had been selling kind of the entry to mid-level hot tubs. They built this brand new, beautiful showroom and suddenly they were selling the high-end spots. Their showroom reflected this higher-end atmosphere. And so those were the ones that they started selling. And as the industry has slowed down over the last year, he's realized that like he's making the same amount of money or more because he's selling up selling something with a higher profit margin. So yeah, funny, it was an exact example of what you're talking about. And it goes with what we talked about. Now, I can't afford an HR attorney. How much they cost? I don't know. Yeah. They'll never buy from me. Let's stick your chin out and give them a reason other than price to buy from you. And I have a, I have three pool contractors right now. I realize this is Foz, but we talk about that all the time. And they say, how the customer says, well, how come he's 10, $20,000 less? And they've tried to justify it and say, I said, stop. I said, I don't know anything about that guy's business, but I got to charge you enough to take care of you. This is a top quality pool. You're in love with the design. It's the top spa. You love it. I don't know anything about that guy. This is what we do. We charge enough to take care of you. Sign here. Give them going with confidence. If you're waffling all the time and willing to discount. And by, by the way, I've got to throw in a discount stat too. Oh, okay. So yeah. we talked about 1% rise in, in prices will increase your profit 14.5%. 10% price increase. You can lose 22% of your business and make the same. The flip side of that is, and I'll ask you rhetorically, Megan, why do people discount? Because they think they need to move more product faster. Right. They want to get more customers. Yeah. Same thing. So how many more customers do you have to have if you have a 22 or a 20% discount? Oh, I, I don't do math. I'm a word well, person. I, this is why I have you. <laughs> it's, a true, it's a true math thing. And I have a table and I'd make it available to anybody who wanted it. But if you have a 35% gross profit margin and you may have more, I don't know, but that's a real, that's in the, right in the wheelhouse. If you have a 35% gross profit margin and you discount your prices 22 or 20%, which is not that outrageous, people do that. Right. You have to do 133% more to stay the same. And that means double plus a third more to stay the same. Yeah. So that means you've got more hours, you've got more capital out there, you've got more inventory hanging out there, you've got more risk that you're not being paid. Got more risk of car accidents, guys driving to jobs and to make the same amount. So that information comes from good books and that's how you can use good books. It's another stat out there. Gosh, I don't remember exactly. Oh, if you raise your gross profit margin by 5%, so that would mean your gross profit on your financial statements. If you don't have good financial statements, you don't know this, but if you do, if you could take it from 35% to 40%, the average pool and spa retailer would increase their net profit 74%. So you look at that in your books and you say, wow, that's a worthwhile 
endeavor. It's not like saying you got to double your sales to double your profit or anything like that. It's just, wow, that is worthwhile. How could I possibly do that? And with financials, you begin to look at your financials and I'll tell you where it's going to be anyway. It's going to be in labor, right? Not necessarily, but pretty much. Yeah. Uh, there are three sources of losses in a lot of things, but labor is always the big variable that I planned it for this and it took twice as long. So then you say, matter of fact, I don't even use it. You have to come up with the ideas. The guys go, yeah, I know where we're wasting labor. It's supposed to be part of my French book from Raymond. AIS at seven o'clock. We're in the, in the seat. Out the door at seven o'clock. The guys come rolling in and they have a cup of coffee and then they go to the convenience store and fill up and then right. they go deliver. And it isn't even the cost of those wasted hours. It's the extra job you didn't do that month or that week, whatever the units are. Right. Be because you have, you've wasted a complete job's worth of labor doing that. So you say, how can I tighten that up? Now I'll tell you a brilliant example from one of my clients. His guys were doing that. He had five crews and they're heading out to go to the convenience store, buy all this stuff. He bought vending machines yeah. and a coffee machines and put them in his shop and they get their stuff there. And nice. I don't want to see, and then he's got procedures. So the trucks are full of gas and all this. But once you zero in on something, you absolutely can find ways to improve it. And, and then you can track how well you're doing because next month is your margin get 1% better. Did it get worse? Why did it get worse? And now you're managing by information, not just how I feel today. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think is really comforting to me <laughs> as a business owner is having something solid to look at and say, okay, this is the truth of how we did yes. despite like you said, how I happen to be feeling that day or I got a phone call from an angry customer or I, we didn't accomplish whatever task we had hoped to do this month. Yeah, it's really nice to have something that it's, no, this is actually what happened, not how you feel about it. That's oh, such a good point. You, you just nailed it because a lot of people, when we sit down and talk about how they bid jobs, Boz are a little more, cons I mean. Pricing's a little more consistent. A, yeah, a little more consistent and so on. But you sit there and say, I bid this with a 35% margin, 50% margin, 40% margin, whatever it is. And then we go look at the books and it's 16. You have to, I've had people argue with me how much money they made on a job. And there's a great quote by a guy named Spencer Tucker, but there, he says, there is no such thing as profit on a sale or a job. There is no such thing. There's only margin. Margin doesn't become profit until you've paid all your overhead. People so argue with me. So if you're just looking me. at like your, so if you're just looking at what you spent on the tub and then what they paid you for the tub, you're really right. missing out on the whole picture because you need to put in Correct. all of the other things, your store, your employees, your insurance, right. all that stuff. We're just in, let's just say you have a 50% margin. So your spa costs you that and the labor doing costs you 50 cents. So you sell a dollar and you say, man, I got a dollar's worth of sales and not my share is 50 cents. Cause I had to spend an additional 50 cents to get that. If I have a hundred dollars worth of overhead divided by 50 cents is 200. I have to sell $200 worth of pools to break even. And that, I think it's the next article we're going to talk about break even. About Maybe break even yeah. <laughs> yeah. Break even is the most important tool in the management toolbox and everybody needs to know it and for their business. One thing I love about our bookkeeper is that when she sends me the thing, the analysis of the end of the month, like she doesn't just send me the books. She actually goes through them and explains things, explains everything. And that's one thing that she puts in there is this is what your break even is for this right. month. Yeah. Right. And it's an incredibly important tool. The most common use of it is to know how much I have to sell exactly. to, to make a profit this month or a true profit to pay all my bills. And, but that's just the start. The issues of 10% price increase could lose 22% of your business and 20% discount. You have to double in a third more. Those were found using break even. And any purchases you want to make, all these things are based on the concept of break even. So it's a really important concept. Yeah, it has been really helpful because it does give me that mark to shoot for. And it's not right. just a pie in the sky 
or this is what we got to because this is what I do is I'll be like, man, this is what we got to this is what we got to sell to pay our printer. But right. I'm missing a lot of other factors in there. Yeah. And that it's really fun. And again, you don't have to be a bookkeeper or finance expert to grasp the concept. And you can just look, what are two numbers? What are my margins and what's my overhead? And you, we'll tell you how to do it, but it's pretty easy. Divide the overhead by the margin. That's how much you got to sell. And some, it's really interesting also how much can you sell in a month, okay? In other words, the capacity of your business, the number of people you have, the number of spas you can receive from your suppliers, all these things. That's my capacity this month. Here's my overhead. How much do I have? Can I, what margin do I have to have so that I can make that capacity pay my overhead? Yeah. I and mean, people is, very seldom do that. Yeah. And I think this is a good time to be having this discussion too, because over the last couple of years, sales have been extreme. Lead times have been extreme. A lot of people have been put on allotment plans. You can only get this many hot tubs a month from us. And those kinds of things. And now that it's starting to slow down, I think there there is the you want to perhaps discount those hot tubs and move some of more of your inventory, especially if you're paying it carrying costs. But if you're not watching those margins, you find yourself in trouble pretty fast if you are not paying attention to your capacity like that. I think it's just it's it's something that I'm afraid we're gonna start seeing more retailers struggle with this year because we were selling enough hot tubs over the last couple of years to hide a lot of poor business decisions. Yes, and that, that brings up another. So we talked about margins and that can be found and figured out on the profit and loss. You mentioned it, but there's a significant number that comes off of the balance sheet and it's called working cap. And there's an official definition of that, which is current uh, liabilities subtracted from current assets and yada, yada. Yeah. But there's a real important thing, especially if you're starting to get more spas in and you can turn it loose and let's go. Maybe you don't have accounts receivable, maybe you do, but you almost certainly have inventory. So if you look at your balance sheet, I'm not saying you necessarily do it on the, because of this podcast, if I've given it sufficient detail, we'll do an article on that too. But if you look at that and say, I typically have a million dollars worth of pools or spas on hand, and I have 20% of my sales, I have accounts sheet. Maybe it's all credit card, you get paid immediately. I don't know, but yeah, that would be typically, nice. Typically in the industry, people put down a deposit and then right. they pay in full when they get their hot tub delivered. So yeah, you usually have some money hanging out there for a while. But that is, that's an excellent contractors on it. Well, anyway, <laughs> a lot of other businesses don't have even that luxury. You know, you're going to get paid in two weeks or after you deliver it. Let's just take the inventory. If you have a million dollars worth of inventory to support $5 million worth of sales, which may be a little high, and then you're going to double your sales to 10 million, you need to look at that and say, oh, I need another million dollars to tie up an in inventory because that's how we've been running the business. So you will be short capital if you just do that without anticipating you're going to need more inventory and have more money tied up in inventory. Or you get better at it and say, how do we increase our inventory turns? And it, once again, you're back in management. So books highlight all kinds of things. The last one, so we talked real quickly about the statement of cash flows, right. which it's my favorite financial statement. It's the hardest to understand, but the easiest to use. And it, I will summarize it in this. If you make a profit, but you don't have money, there are only three reasons. One, you haven't been paid yet, which is pretty good spa, not so good in the pool contract. <laughs> but that's the number one reason you haven't been paid yet. You made a sale, it shows up in your sales, shows up as profit, but you don't have the money because you haven't been paid. The second one is you already spent the money buying assets or paying down debt. Okay. So the millions you borrowed to start your company and it's costing you $20,000 a month. That's not right. an expense, but that's where your money went or buying more spas put out there. So you haven't been paid yet. You already spent it paying debt or buying assets, or you took it. And by that, I mean, you as the owner took draws. And I see that a lot that people, and Hey, it's your company. That's the point, but not if it throws you into cash flow. We made $700,000 last year and I don't have a nickel and I'm down 200,000 in the bank. What happened? 
you start looking, you realize I dribbled out a hundred thousand dollars worth of checks, which is okay, but make sure you know about that. And most people I find don't, but with good books, you can see that. Yeah. It's kind of, I feel like that's something that's easy to get. Um, yeah. Easy to lose track of if you're not watching yeah. your cash flow and not watching your books carefully. It's, oh, I got to do this. So I'm just going to, I'll just take another few thousand dollars. Swipe the company debit card, mm -hmm. not even saying for inappropriate person purposes. It's just, right. just make it so easy to spend. And that is a hard number to find on the profit and loss of the balance sheet, but it's right there on your, on your statement of cash flows. There's a line. Okay. You, and it says minus whatever you, or if you put money in, it'll say plus. But people generally remember putting money in and don't remember taking money out. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and the point of understanding where it went, haven't been paid or already spent it on debt or buying assets or I took it, those, that's it. Nope, that's it. I do bring up another one that somebody embezzled from you, uh, mm -hmm. which is another reason to have good books and happens all the time. But if you know which of those three or what combination of those three, now you can look at it and manage it. You don't find out when you're short of money, you realize ahead of time that you will be short of money. So you cash. So you take action to quit doing something, or maybe you go to the bank and get a line of credit and say, I know I'm going to have a shortfall. I need it for this. And bankers love that. Somebody walks in ahead of time. So let me ask you, we talked about this whole podcast has been about having good books, right? Right. <laughs> so I guess my question is, where do people go to get that? So I think a lot of hot tub retailers, they'll have an in-house person who does the bookkeeping, but that's not necessarily going to be the person that helps you analyze everything. Or maybe they are, if they're trained in that. But I don't, I imagine most bookkeepers at hot tub companies are more or less paper pushing and not necessarily analyzing anything. So where no. do you find a person to say, to help you dive into that? Because like me, I need help with that. That's not my wheelhouse. I mean, that is such a stellar question. I love accountants. I really do. But accountants typically are, they're forensic and audit and cost mm -hmm. accountants and tax accountants. Most accountants that I meet are tax accountants. Yeah. And even the ones who keep people's books, say, don't worry about it. We'll have it in time for your taxes. I said, I need to know today, not next September. Yes. No, that's funny because when a lot of times when people outsource their books, like that's the complaint I hear is that right. it takes so long to get the information back that it's not very useful. I'm not that, I don't get rich off my book. I don't, but I, re <laughs> I refer people to it because I describe what proper books look like. And then there's a procedure called closing them. And that kind of means something official what I mean is making sure they're right every month. By the 15th of the following month, you get correct books. And to get correct books is not an easy thing because you have to match. You, you have to do some things. If you get the deposit this month, but don't do anything till next month, nothing. You show this big profit this month. And then next month, when you buy the spa and have it delivered, you show a big loss and just hundreds of things. That, so somebody competent understanding needs to understand, I need to match these so that you get a true picture of what happened. And that requires some skill. So to your original question is it's really hard. And over the years, I've worked with a lot of accountants and a lot, and I have found two, one of whom is working with you and another lady whom I think very highly of, they are CPAs and they have a fleet of bookkeepers that they oversee. And they make sure it's done properly. They do not do taxes. Yeah. So finding you, you can do it yourself. That's the purpose of my book. Right. If you're not interested in it, then the book can become a little tedious later on. But when the question actually arises, you can go to an example in there and go, that's what he was right. talking about. I think so when we hired our accountant to do our taxes, I think I expected there to be more of that kind of back and forth, right? But that, but I realized quickly that was not what he did. He does, he does taxes. Right. He doesn't do like business right. advising and I'm going to analyze your numbers and all of that. That was not, that wasn't his thing. His thing was to help me pay the least amount in taxes. <laughs> right. So then, so yeah, so it wasn't until I found this bookkeeper that I really got a good balance of the two and they work together, which is also really great to make sure that things are exactly right. Even then I still needed to throw you in there. <laughs> To sit down well, every other week and say, okay, let's look at this. 
That's why there was an opportunity to write the book I wrote. When I came out of being in business, I've always been a numbers man. It came from my father who was an entrepreneur and had a manufacturing company. And I was talking about break even when I was 16. I, that's I really, not, I that's literally, not I, normal, Martin. <laughs> no, it is not normal. But I, my dad was amazing and he had some really stellar people around and he let me sit in. And so I've been aware of it my whole life. Not, I've had to learn. I've also learned a lot, but yeah. And I thought everybody else would be. And when I started coaching, that's one of the first things that I, what? You don't know your margins. You don't know your break even. Yeah. You don't even know if you made a profit last month. No. You know, that the thing that's I'm going, funny is shot. that. The thing that's funny is that I love looking at that information and I love figuring out how you can tweak things and make it better and all of the math that we've been talking about. I, I find it all so interesting, but there is something about it that just also gives me so much anxiety <laughs> that I won't do it unless I have someone like walking me through the process and holding my hand because it's right. not, there are like two or three things being a business owner that just make me that just really are uncomfortable and not, I feel, un yeah, I just feel uncomfortable and gives me a lot of anxiety. And that's one of them is dealing with the money side of it. And so it's really good to have someone who can talk me through it and talk me down. Even though I like it, yeah. I still, it still is such an anxiety ridden thing for me that I don't want to study it. I don't want people to have to know too much, but a few things, uh, how margins work and where your cash went in. Things like what is working capital. You don't need to be a financial whiz to understand that. Yeah. You can have a dashboard. I do like to bring up books, double entry books, which is what we're talking about, have been around since the Middle Ages in the 1200s. This means Cratchit, was it? Bob Marley's or the. Oh, from not Dickens? Bob, not Barley. <laughs> Barley, not, not the singer Bob Marley. Yeah, no, yeah not Bob Marley. He was posting books, right? He was keeping double entry books. That means that people were keeping books and this system was invented while people were dying of the plague, right? Yeah. And it has survived unchanged. It was popularized in 1494 by a guy named Luca Pacioli, and he's seen as the father of, in, of double entry books, but it was popularized in 1494 and it's unchanged today. You're not going to improve it by making an Excel spreadsheet or, and a lot of the things QuickBook does to try to make things easier, at least to a guy like me, you're like, what? <laughs> what? But anyway, you're not going to improve it, but it has survived this long because the problems it solves have, are the same as they were in the 1200s. And so there's, it's pretty good reason. Very few things have survived since the middle ages unchanged. Yeah. And it's one of them. It makes me laugh because. Business owners, we always think that our business is a super special unicorn. There's nothing out there like it. We face challenges that no one else ever faces. We, our industry goes through things that no other industries ever go through. And it's just not true. There's just no, there's no new problems under the sun. And for businesses, you can take it and move it to a different industry. And it's really exactly the same, right. exactly the same things. We're all using the same books. We all are selling something or we all should have customers be. we're all selling right. something we all have customers we all have overhead yeah. like we're not we're not as special as we like to as we like to think we are i do say that all businesses are unique and all businesses are the same and i've had i almost have to look but i tell people i have a publisher as a client i've had doctors majority of my, of my clients are contractors of some sort manufacturers builders what i call industrial but i've got i literally have to open a book and look to remember all the different kinds of businesses and they say, insurance, what experience do you have in insurance? I, have, I bought a lot of it. I don't know. But that's not the point. Or retail. And re retail where people come in the store, there are ways to have BOGO offers. And of course, I'm against the, We got to do the math on that and see how many more you got to sell to be right, in right. But So there are a lot of details that, that specialists, like if you had a dentist, and there are people who are really good at managing insurance payments for dentists. Which is great. I don't know all that stuff. I do know about getting your margins up, right? <laughs> and, yeah. And if you're spiffing the gentle hygienist for every patient who comes in, there's a variable cost. So you got to recover that first. Then you've got a margin. Then you got to pay for the office and the chairs and all that stuff. So they are the same, but they're also unique. So yeah. 
We'll let people be unique the same kind of way. <laughs> I think that probably wraps everything up for okay. today and for this article. But at the end of every episode, we ask everybody the Spa Retailer 5. The okay. same five questions we ask every person who comes on. We'll just make him do we'll just make it you do it this one time. Then you don't have to do it again. <laughs> okay. Is that gonna be how many spas I sold last? Oh, that is we do we change them for the we adjust them for the guest. <laughs> okay. I have a number, zero. Oh, as I sold last month. That's fine. Yeah. Do you remember what your first sale was ever? As a coach? No, as any business. Do you just remember the first time that you made a yes. sale? It was a sale in the sense that it was a purchase because I was running grain elevators. There and, you go. Uh, I, had, I was 25. They sent me over to open the office at this remote elevator because they'd caught the previous manager stealing. Mm. And they sent me over to, literally with the keys to open it. And I stayed there for 12 years. So the first customer walked, I won't give you the whole story, but I remember uh, a guy coming in, a farmer sold me, I don't know, 40, 50,000 bushels of corn and he tried to cheat me. I could, it's a great story, but he didn't win. But oh, well, that's I, good. I remember it clearly. His name was Ernie Moss. He's long dead, so I can say his name, but I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, I thought he was going to pull one over on the new young guy. <laughs> that's one. And. I'm sure a lot of them did pull them over on me and I still don't know about it, but he, yeah, I remember that. That's amazing. That's why I love asking that question because a lot of times, not only do they remember the sale, they remember the model, they remember the name of the customer, they remember what their occupation was. It's a big deal. Yep. I remember all of that. So what was your first, what was your first real job? Like W2? I got a job. I wanted to be a tree trimmer and there was a guy here in town and they used chainsaws and they were climbers. And his name was Norman Rungi. And all the time, when I was 12, I'd walk by and these guys would be up in trees running chainsaws and oh, it's the most yeah. awesome thing in the world. And I asked him for a job and he said, no, because I was 12. Because you were 12, right? I kept asking him when I got to high school, he gave me a job. And I started by being a dragger. And mm -hmm. for listeners who aren't familiar, you can put more lumber on the ground with a chainsaw in five minutes than you can drag out in two days. But anyway, that's what I started doing. And then I got, I showed up for work and, and exhibited those trays. And pretty soon I had my own crew and still so, proud of it. Yeah. So did you end up being the trees and sawing oh, yeah. stuff off? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, man. Oh, no, that was, that's, that was the goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you, no, kind of, are, you are you an adrenaline junkie? I didn't I know if that was a general adrenaline, but I thought it was just cooler than hell. Okay. Guys up there, I just thought it was awesome. And it was also really hard. I imagine it yeah. was. Yeah. But it was cool. So this might be difficult because you've got a lot of different and experiences to pull from. But do you remember what you would call maybe your biggest flop in business, something that you really thought was going to take off. And then it just did not. I got two of them. <laughs> I was going to say, you and did say, say you had flop, two businesses that failed. So. <laughs> yeah. We had a spinoff out of the university of Oklahoma. I had a biology degree and then I'd been in agriculture. So that combined unit, this was back in the early nineties when we were coming up with GMOs. And I don't know what people think about GMOs. It, they're wonderful. Okay. I, now that's not Roundup, but anyway, there are all kinds of nutritional things that come from that. People would be starving and malnourished without, anyway, they're wonderful things. But our, my professor had a, or my partner was a professor and he had a couple of genes that were active against pests and pathogens in food crop. And GMOs are really awesome. They're, they can do a thing. It's like programming a computer. It really is. Yeah. So they would have this gene and you don't want your corn plant spending energy making a protein to defend against corn rootworm if there are no corn rootworms. Okay. So there's a thing called a promoter. There's a gene that got a wound inducible promoter. So it doesn't make that until rootworm bites the plant. Then it turns on scabbing is a very complex process. You don't want clots in your say, plate all the time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so then it would turn on, kill the, anyway, it's awesome stuff. And we've got, got a, venture fund in it. It wasn't really a venture fund. It was more of a hedge fund. And they gave us many millions of dollars valuation. And we didn't have a viable product and we didn't have a viable market, but this was before the world had all those things. And my professor partner turned out to be a real snake. And he showed up at the closing meeting 
with an attorney and with all these demands anyway, it blew up. So I, two, three years of hard effort and a lot of people lost money. Oh man, that's guy. so frustrating. But, yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. I've just gotten to where I don't lie awake at night cussing that guy. <laughs> no, that, that's been a long time. So what's one of the best ideas that you've ever had in your career? Marrying my wife, Diane Holland, and that's not blowing smoke. That's the most wonderful thing. She is a business owner now. Yes. You and I talk about her a lot. She started from scratch. She's a speech language pathologist. She started from scratch after teaching that subject in the university for years and has grown, started in 14, has grown to 25 therapists in her clinic now. She's a magnificent business owner. She read my book, <laughs> by the way. A quick story on that, or I don't yeah, know. No, 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 we're good. No, and it took two years to write this book in writing article. I always bring it home. Would you read this? Would you read this? And she said, no. She says, you're just going to argue with me about what I said. <laughs> and then you're going to go back and you're going to change it. And you're going to want me to read it. And she goes, no, I'll read it when it's done. Yeah. I came home when the, I got my first copy. I came home and I sat on the kitchen counter and I left the room. And I came back and she's sitting in the backyard by our pool which is, I won't name all the equipment on the pool. Cause I don't know <laughs> but anyway, she's sitting out there reading my book. So I knew better than to go out there and what do you think? I left the next day, which was Sunday. She was out there again, reading it. So I left again. She came in that night. She asked me about four relevant questions about, cause we run her clinic on break even. Oh yeah. baby. And everybody in the clinic, including the lead therapist and all, know what break-even is and what we have to do to hit it, right. and what we have to hit it, do to hit our targets. They know that. And she said, this, then this. I said, yeah, that's right. She goes, oh my gosh. And she, I've got to have a meeting. So she scheduled a staff meeting and she explained break-even to them, which is pretty simple. If you leave all the other stuff out, you just show them this. Right. And she's been running that way ever since. So every, she's just wonderful. So that I really agree. is the best decision she, I ever made. She is a, she is pretty, pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> so now, I, uh, can I get the link to send this to her? By the way, I get some points for that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. So I know you're a reader. I think every time we meet, you recommend a new, a new book to me, but do you have a favorite book or TV show podcast, something that you enjoy or have enjoyed over the years? Boy, best book. It depends on what, so I'm, this I know. is going to be tough. Totally out there, but I'm concerned, and I don't mean politically, I'm just concerned about the country, as I think everybody is, and as everybody always has been. But there's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, and I get two authors, and it's really good about what's going on. And they don't take a side and say, these guys are idiots, and those guys are, hey, they're going, they're legitimate points, but what's happening? And they have some great, insights now how's that apply to spas i don't know hey. something to read while you're in the spa there you go there you go no i think that's we talked about that book the other day i have not read it but it does sound like something that i think our audience would could be pretty interested yeah. in. it's a real look at what's going and by the way i'll say this i've been besperching millennials for a lot of years millennials you know they don't want to work first of all i'm a anecdotally millennial. there you go and so is my daughter, Katie, and so is her friend, Claire, and so is Khalil. And I'm just thinking, I know all these magnificent millennials. And they even say the millennials are not the issue. It's called Gen Z, and which is also <laughs> called iGen. And they have some attributes. Obviously, they're wonderful people in of every stripe. Yeah, these are generalizations. They Oh, absolutely. But they talk about what has happened and how it manifests itself. And they even say colleges are not responsible for this which is what everybody, or universities, they said they're dealing with it. They're dealing with what has arrived. Now there's, you can yeah. point fingers anywhere you want, but I thought, wow, that's insightful. And it, that quickly, it changed my mind and my attitude, which subliminal <laughs> stupid colleges are ruining our kids. And I thought, wow. That's so anyway, we, that's clear off the subject, but. Great. Martin, we will see you again in a month or two on the podcast. Right. So thank you for doing this. You didn't know when you took me on as a client, it would mean you had to do uh, all this extra homework. <laughs> I, I love it. You know, I like to have in mind somebody that might actually read or hear and use it and it might change their life.
Yeah, let us know. A little bit. Yeah, let us know if any of these, any of these tips, any of these pointers, information is helpful to you. All right, that's it for the Spa Retailer Podcast. Thanks so much, Mar- thanks so much, Martin. Thanks for having me on. I really love it. The Spa Retailer Podcast is a production of Spa Retailer Magazine. Let us know what you think by leaving a review or emailing us at podcast at spa Thanks for listening.